So today I'm going to talk about um, uh, the death of diagnosis, or really a, about a, a different way of thinking about diagnosis. And I'm going to use um, vascular uh, disease examples, which is the reason for the, the picture here. Um, I've, um, I'm, a, I'm a vascular disease epidemiologist. Um, I trained in medicine in the 70s, practiced a little bit, and then in the 1980s, um, I retrained in public health epidemiology. And um, by the 1990s, uh, we'd seen a, a major decline in, in, in coronary disease uh, across the Western world, particularly in New Zealand, Australia, uh, the US, and Finland, and, and that's continued. Um, 80% plus reduction, 80% plus reduction in, in coronary heart disease mortality in New Zealand and Australia since 1967. Um, much of the early reduction, uh, almost certainly related to a decline in smoking, decline in uh, saturated fat consumption in, in countries like New Zealand and Australia, uh, and more recently, um, uh, treatment has had a, a, a significant input, uh, an impact on this. And so, um, whereas my early work, particularly in the 1980s, was uh, from a public health perspective, my interest has always been cardiovascular and has always been how do we reduce the impact of cardiovascular disease. But in, those, um, in, in the first decade of, of my cardiovascular career, I focused almost entirely on public health interventions. Uh, taxation for tobacco. Uh, I'm well known for trying to stop people eat butter. You can have it on your birthday. Um, uh, but by the 1990s, it became very clear to me that uh, we really need to focus far more on the clinical interventions um, with powerful drugs, simple uh, drugs, effective drugs. Uh, they were expensive then, most of them, although they're much cheaper now. And so I moved... Um, uh, somewhat from a public health focus, um, and I wanted to use my epidemiological uh, experience and knowledge uh, to focus more on on um, on clinical um, approaches to uh, managing cardiovascular disease. Mm -hmm. So, um, the thesis of my presentation um, today, and in fact, probably. Um, uh, uh, Really, this, this statement and several others made by Geoffrey Rose, who's a cardiovascular disease epidemiologist in the, in the UK, died maybe 10 to 15 years ago, but he made this statement back in the 1980s that there is no disease, the risk, the bit in brackets I've added, but there's no disease that you either have or don't have except perhaps sudden death and rabies. Um, all other diseases, you have between a little and a lot of it. And... Um, and at the time, I didn't really think um, much of it, but I, I did remember the statement. Um, but over the years, it, it's had a major impact on, on, on my research. And so what I want to talk about um, today is, 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 is really thinking um, more about a continuum of risk rather than a dichotomous um, disease construct. I mean, many of us are, um, were trained that you have a disease or you don't. Now, as you all know, um, uh, it's not dichotomous, and um, I'm, I'm sure that when you make diagnoses, um, even though you might make a statement, this patient has this disease, you are thinking uh, about the continuum of risk. And I, I just want to push that, um, I guess, push that concept further in this lecture. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about how do you communicate risk. It's much easier to say you've got this disease or you don't than trying to communicate um, a continuum of risk with your patients. And, and, and finally, I want to talk a bit about how we can generate the data, the evidence we need to enable us to talk more about risk than disease. Um, so, because it, it is quite a challenge. So, I'm going to start with, um, you know, some might say this isn't a disease anyway. Well, it, it, well, it isn't a disease, but some people have called it um, a disease. And I'm sure everyone in this room has used the term hypertension. Um, and I put it to you that you should never use that word again. It has no place 
The term hypertension, I do not believe, has any place uh, in the vocabulary of a clinician, or indeed a patient, or indeed anyone. There is no such thing as hypertension. And in fact, I think it's probably an unsafe statement to say. Um, why do I say that? Well, here's some data. I don't have a mouse, but you can look at it. On the, um, this is data on uh, blood pressure on the horizontal axis and uh, ischemic heart disease mortality on the vertical axis. Now, this is a doubling scale. You can see on the vertical axis, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. I'd need maybe a 10-storey, 20-storey building to put this um, on a numerical scale. Um, but this, um, this data comes from about a million people um, who had their blood pressure and other risk factors measured um, at baseline, and they've been followed for at least 10 years. And you can see there are, different, there are different age groups. And the risk of ischemic heart disease, and indeed I could have put stroke, I could have put any vascular disease, uh, increases um, uh, monotonically um, on this uh, logarithmic scale from about 110 uh, systolic, 110 systolic, right up to about 190. Um, so where is hypertension on that? There is, I mean, uh, I guess the only uh, reasonable definition of hypertension there would be 110 systolic, which is pretty much everyone in this room, which makes it meaningless as well. So we've all got hypertension. Well, there may be some people here who don't, um, whatever that is, maybe with a systolic of 90 or 100. But, but basically, um, it, there's, there's, I don't know what hypertension is. It's never made any sense to me. And, and added to this, if you look at, this, at the way this is stratified into different age groups from 40 to 49 and so on, um, if you take a particular blood pressure and, you know, the, the current flavour of the, well, the hypertension in 2013, if you ask medical students, the ones who I haven't told that there's no such thing, um, or, or if you ask them what they've been told by their um, clinical teachers, people like you, or maybe physiologists, I'm not sure, but anyway, then normally, currently the, the commonest definition is 140. When I was at medical school, it, um, when I first went to medical school, it was uh, 100 plus your age. And then it changed to, I think, 160 or 170, and it keeps on coming down over my career. But it's currently 140, unless you're diabetic, then it's 130, systolic, that is. Um, in fact, we used to talk about diastolic, but diastolic blood pressure um, is so last century, we only talk about systolic now. So, I mean, it, you know, it just changes. It's fickle as. Um, but the other, the other point I'd make here is that if you look... Um, Forget about the unit on the vertical axis, but if you've got a systolic of 140 and you're between 40 to 49 years of age, you have a risk of uh, ischemic heart disease event over the next five to 10 years of, of, if you look at this unit, it's two. That same blood pressure in someone 10 years older has a risk of seven. If they're 10 years older, it's about 16 and so on. And if you're 80 to 85, um, that blood pressure gives you a risk in the order of 110, 120, using the same units. So a particular blood pressure, if you say we have to have a blood pressure, means something completely different based on your age. So not only is there no point on this continuum that actually separates people with hypertension or not, but also if you choose any point arbitrarily, it means something completely different if you're 40 or you're 80 or any age in between. So it doesn't make any sense clinically at all to me. And here's, um, I've just added, the, the previous slide just has uh, one additional factor, age, but on this slide, again, on the horizontal axis, systolic blood pressure, on the vertical axis, this time it's total cardiovascular risk per 100 people per five years. And the, the bottom blue line is increasing blood pressure in a 50-year-old woman with an ideal risk profile. And you can see, yes, as her blood pressure increases, her risk increases, but not by a lot. But if that same 50-year-old woman had a high total cholesterol, it pushes everything up 
a bit. And if she's also a smoker, and you see the, the kind of yellow line, then uh, it pushes up again, and also she has a low HDL. And so, again, if you've got this um, blood pressure, and this is just taking one age and one gender, um, then, again, the blood pressure of 140 or whatever you choose means something completely different, depending on the other risk factors present. So this dichotomy of hypertension, no hypertension, makes no clinical sense, and it makes even less clinical sense when you think about treatments. Now, if, if we look at cardiovascular disease risk now, um, we currently have treatments that can halve risk reasonably easily if you stop smoking plus take a statin and a blood pressure lowering drug or um, you take a statin and a blood pressure lowering drug and aspirin, pretty much our standard treatments can halve your risk of, of, of a cardiovascular event. So it is extremely important to have measured or to know something about the patient's risk, not just whether they're hypertensive or not, because if they're, if for example, when you put the combination of risk factors together and their risk over the next five years is 20%, your treatment can halve that risk to 10%. But if their risk starts at 10%, your treatment is halved to five and so on. And, and, and indeed, that 50-year-old um, woman with the um, uh, idea risk profile, if she had hypertension, um, her risk would be below that blue co um, column, the 2.5%. So if you treated her, yes, you could reduce her risk, but um, by far less than uh, the woman if she was, had a risk of 20%. And I can give you many examples, many case studies of typ typical patients where um, one woman has a, a, has a systolic blood pressure of 135, but has a 20% five-year risk. And she wouldn't, based on a, you know, a traditional uh, treat hypertension, she wouldn't get blood pressure lowering because her blood pressure was slightly less than this 140. But I can show you other women who have a five-year risk of, a, of a, less than 2% less than 2% who have a systolic of 142 and they would get drugs. Now, that's what I call dangerous. That's poor medicine, that's bad, poor quality. That's what I mean by uh, why I believe the construct is dangerous. Um, so, you know, I, I'm sure you've got that now. Um, and, and just, I mean, I'm often challenged when I show this, well, where's the evidence? Where's the evidence that treating according to risk is, is there? Well, fortunately, we now have the evidence. We haven't got this data published, yes, but this is an individual patient meta-analysis that um, some colleagues of mine and, and George Institute in Australia and um, Johan Sundram, who's a, a, a Swedish epidemiologist, have put together. Individual patient meta-analysis of uh, a large number of randomized controlled trials of blood pressure alone drugs versus placebo. And on the vertical axis, uh, the CVD events prevented or avoided per thousand treated. And on the, the horizontal axis, you see their systolic blood pressure. That's the uh, going from, uh, well, my right to the left, I'm sure it's, you can see, uh, with increasing reduction in um, systolic blood pressure from 4, 8, 12 to 16 millimetres. And then on the other axis is the five-year CVD risk. And, and, and basically... I almost wish I could press, have I got a pointer here? I have got a pointer, have I? Oh, it doesn't matter. Anyway, the, the key issue is that, yes, the more you lower blood pressure, the greater the benefit of treatment. So if you, if you look as you lower blood pressure more, the benefit of treatment uh, increases. But look up the other axis, and the higher your pre-treatment risk, the greater the benefit of the greater the benefit of treatment, okay? And so you actually gain as much by treating someone, by lowering someone's blood pressure by four millimeters of mercury if they have a 15 to 20% five-year risk as you do from lowering someone with a much lower risk by 12 millimeters of mercury, okay? So yes, Lowering blood pressure reduces your risk, but the impact, the 
the absolute benefit of lowering blood pressure is much greater in people at high cardiovascular risk. And the people we need to treat first, the priority, are those in the groups with the highest columns. Okay. So this is the randomized control trial evidence um, that it works. And the way they did this is they took all the trials, they developed, a, they gave everyone a cardiovascular disease risk at baseline, and then followed them through. So they retrospectively gave everyone a cardiovascular risk at baseline to do this. And I believe this is the definitive evidence of, of this approach. Now, based on what I've been talking about, some years ago we developed um, these cardiovascular risk charts um, that have been used in New Zealand for some years. We, we don't use these charts anymore, we use electronic versions, but, but basically this was a simple chart that we uh, provided GPs um, that you could take a patient and based on their age, their gender, their ethnicity, uh, their blood pressure, um, their lipids and whether they had diabetes or not, you could estimate their five-year risk of a cardiovascular event. And this helped inform your treatment decision. And um, you could look at this, you could take any blood pressure, you could take a particular blood pressure on this, on this chart, say 140, 85, and you'll find every color in that rainbow. Um, uh, you'll find someone with a blood pressure of 140 or 150, and um, that same blood pressure can mean any of the colors on that rainbow. And that rainbow, um, uh, from uh, blue to red, uh, the further you get, the closer you get to red, the greater the benefit of treatment, um, whatever the blood pressure. Okay, so that's um, hypertension. So obviously there's no such thing as hyperlipidemia, and I won't, um, uh, I, I won't push this too far, but same sort of data. This is um, on, on the left is um, uh, increasing HDL um, and uh, risk of coronary disease. And as you well know, as your HDL goes up, your risk goes down. Uh, the middle one is non-HDL cholesterol, basically LDL. And as you know, as your LDL goes up, your risk of cardiovascular disease or coronary disease goes up. And on the, on the, on the right, is um, uh, the total cholesterol to HDL ratio and risk of coronary disease. And um, the ratio is a better predictor of disease um, than either HDL or LDL alone. Um, and again, um, there's no threshold. And again, uh, it makes, it's very important what your age is. And again, I could add, it also is very important what your blood pressure is, whether you smoke or not, etc. Um, there's also, and this is published, there's the same evidence as I showed on, on two slides ago. This is a, a large individual patient meta-analysis of the STATIN trials, published in the Lancet in 2012. And, and as you can see there, yes, the more you lower LDL on the horizontal axis, the greater the benefit of treatment on the vertical axis, but on the other axis, the five-year cardiovascular risk axis, you can see that the benefits of statins is extremely dependent on your baseline cardiovascular risk. Now, it does seem, it's very interesting, while people still talk about hypertension, not many people talk about hypercholesterolemia. Or, actually, there never was a term like hypertension um, with dyslipidemia. People talk about dyslipidemia. Uh, we seem to be much more comfortable with not dichotomizing your lipid levels than we are with blood pressure. Not quite sure why. Maybe it's because you know, hypertension has been around much longer. I'm, I'm not sure. It's an interesting question. Anyway, so of course the next thing is there's no such thing as type 2 diabetes. I mean, where do I stop? But um, um, there's mean fasting glucose. This is a very large meta-analysis of observational studies. Um, risk of vascular disease increases from um, uh, blood glucose of about five, just over five. It does seem to be, if you go lower, this is different from most of the other cardiovascular risk factors. Um, it um, does seem to be harmful to have a lower a lower level, although it's the same with actually BMI, which I'll show you. Um, there's well, the definition of, as you well know, the definition of diabetes is changing. Um, uh, glucose is so last year, um, if not two years ago. In New Zealand now, our um, um, diagnosis of diabetes is made based on HbA1c. Uh, we don't use glucose anymore in this country, um, except, I guess, if you want to see whether someone's 
responding badly to their treatment. But um, basically, diagnosis is now primarily HbA1c. Um, and what am I trying to trying to change a slide? Doesn't want to change. There it is. Um, so uh, one of the arguments for the threshold that we use for um, uh, defining diabetes is based on microvascular disease rather than macrovascular disease. And here you look at uh, glycemia and diabetic retinopathy. Um, again, you can see a continuum. There really isn't, um, uh, again, no retinopathy with a um, fasting plasma glucose below about Five it depends depends on the studies that you're looking at. HbA1c below six, but again, um, there really is no threshold. Although you can, once you get to a, a, a glucose below about 5.5, um, or an HbA1c above uh, below about 5.5, about the same, um, you don't really see much um, microvascular disease. But of course, um, two thirds to three quarters of all um, vascular complications of uh, diabetes are macrovascular. Um, microvascular is an important but um, less component. And then um, this is some unpublished data looking at the relationship. It's a bit like some of those previous slides that um, the, uh, the columns represent increasing HbA1c and uh, each of the blocks uh, relates to different combinations of risk factors. So, you know, if you're a non-smoking, non-diabetic uh, woman aged 55 with an ideal risk profile, it doesn't really matter what your HbA1c is within reason, um, you have a very low vascular risk. But as you get older, if you're male, if you have other risk factors, the importance of that HbA1c um, um, changes. So again, you know, diabetic, um, whatever the current definition of diabetes, um, if you're, you know, if your HbA1c is a little bit under, are you not diabetic? If it's a bit over, are you diabetic? What about all of the other risk factors that have a major impact on, on the importance or the impact of that dysglycemia? Dysglycemia, extremely important. Dyslipidemia, extremely important. Blood pressure, raised blood pressure, extremely important, but the impact is hugely affected by the other risk factors present. And so I think we're doing our, dis our patients a serious disservice by dichotomizing these individual risk factors. Um, I, I, you know, how long do you go? But obesity is quite seeing it's in the media now. Obesity, well, look, here's, um, here's the most important paper ever, I believe, written um, on obesity, written by the late um, uh, Gary Whitlock, um, an epidemiologist who a New Zealander, trained in New Zealand, but worked with Richard Pito in Oxford for many years. He um, died um, uh, late last year, but he, he spent more time writing this paper than he did studying medicine, which was really interesting. But um, this is about a million people again followed for 10 years and looking at BMI, um, and he looked at a lot of outcomes, but this is BMI and total mortality. And um, a bit like glucose, you see that um, if your BMI is too low, um, there seems to be an upturn. Uh, now, whether that's because disease, as a result of disease, you stop eating and your BMI g goes lower. He did look at, he, he tried to take out all those diseased people, but, but still. But, you know, you look at this, so yes, um, if there is any um, threshold, a, a BMI of about 24, 25, just about is, is uh, um, you have the lowest risk of total mortality, and it increases um, after that. There's, you know, what we have a definition of obesity of 30. What does that mean? Um, not a lot, um, and it doesn't make any sense as to why, why, why choose 30 as the definition of obesity. And particularly uh, when you look, and this just has smokers and non-smokers, but um, this, a smoker with the ideal BMI um, has the same risk of mortality as a never smoker with a BMI of about 37. So, which means that smoking is equivalent to being about 40 to 50 kilograms overweight. But, but again, um, you know, the importance of your BMI is dependent on all these other risk factors.
Okay, so I hope I've convinced you, certainly in the vascular area, and I believe that what I'm saying about vascular risk factors um, that have, you know, for many years been dichotomized is also relevant for many of the so-called diseases. You know, having coronary heart disease, it's a continuum. Uh, cancer, most cancers, I mean, I, I, I don't know nothing about cancer, very little, but when I talk to my colleagues who work in, 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 with cancer, they say, well, we've all got cancer. We've all got cancer, just how many cells and, and how spread they are. So, so I, I think this is relevant across medicine. Very few diseases you, you have or don't have. Um, so the next issue, if, if we accept that um, uh, there is no such thing as disease, well, very few dichotomous diseases, the next issue is how do we actually communicate risk? It was, I have to say that um, one of the biggest challenges in, in, in my career working in risk is, is actually dealing with the additional work it means for, general, most of my work has been focused on general practitioners, but it was so easy to uh, get out your sphygmo manometer, measure someone's blood pressure, and, uh, and the patient could see it, and you could say, you've got hypertension, and I have a drug that I can lower that blood pressure. You actually see it. it. It seemed to make a lot of sense. It was easy. It was very easy to communicate a disease called hypertension and a treatment designed to treat hypertension. You actually almost see the blood pressure coming down. Um, risk is a much more difficult thing to communicate. And um, we've been attempting to, to communicate um, risk um, with our patients. And, and here's, a, um, here's a patient, 35-year-old overweight smoker, non-diabetic, whatever that means, blood pressure 142. Well, you can read that. He has that five-year cardiovascular risk of 4%, but of course he has a long-term his long-term risk is quite high, and, and he's one of these patients who's probably a ticking time bomb. And this has been one of our challenges because um, clinicians say he, he's got hypertension, and long-term he's got a problem, um, even though his, his risk at the moment is so low because he's so young. So what we've done is we've developed a, uh, something we call a heart forecast, my, my colleagues and I, and, and this is an electronic tool. You plug in the person's risk factors, um, and there's his uh, five-year risk. The vertical axis gives you his five-year absolute risk, and along the horizontal axis is his age. And so he currently has a 4% four, 4 five-year risk. But this blue line, this is his five-year cardiovascular risk over his lifetime. It's not his lifetime risk. Uh, lifetime risk is a meaningless concept for a clinician. You know, it's one per person per lifetime. It's the death rate. Okay, the ideal cardiovascular lifetime cardiovascular risk is a hundred percent, and you die um, in your sleep um, after your hundredth birthday. So that, the ideal, so lifetime risk is is not a concept, but short term risk over your lifetime is an important concept, and and that blue line is the short term risk if he had the ideal risk factor profile, and. When you just draw a horizontal line, that means that this 35-year-old, his current risk, he wouldn't reach that current risk until he was 55 years of age if he had the ideal risk profile. So in effect, he's kind of got the heart of a 55-year-old and he's 35. So it kind of is an attempt to communicate this patient's what he could do to reduce his risk. Okay, the five-year risk is what we use to make should to decide should we give them drugs today. The heart age is a way of communicating to him about what he could do to change his risk. He's got a bit of time up his sleeve, but this is what he could do. Um, and then we we continue on this. You know, this is what the red line is what will happen if he continues um, the way he is. And then we have these sliders on, on the right-hand side that if you lower your blood pressure, lower your lipids, you, this thing is interactive and it, it gives you risk. So these are some of the tools. So, so I, I don't want to underestimate the challenge of, challenges of communicating risk. Disease was much easier, a much easier construct to, to, um, to communicate. But I do put it to you that you cannot have an informed discussion with a patient without discussing these 
absolute risks of disease and the benefits of treatment. So if you tell your patient they have hypertension, if you base your treatment decisions on a blood pressure of 140, 150 or whatever, and it's the same with many other diseases, you can't have a, you can't have a meaningful con uh, conversation with your patient about what you're doing because your blood pressure is a useless measure of your risk. These dichotomous measures are useless measures of your risk and because the benefits of treatment and the harms are directly proportional to your, to your risk, if you're, using, if you're using a diagnostic tool that doesn't divide people into risk categories, then how can you communicate the benefits of your treatment if you couldn't even communicate what their risk was? <laughs> okay? I mean, we have, and I, I'm sure you all do this to a certain extent, and even though you might tell patients that they've got this disease, the next step is what that means in terms of their prognosis with and without treatment. And that will vary depending on their age, their gender, and all their other risk factors. So, okay, so what, so where's this data? You need good data on, on risk prediction. Where do we get this data? So, um, you know, I, I started thinking seriously about risk prediction in 1990, and by about the end of the decade, um, we'd been using risk prediction tools. In fact, the risk prediction tool that, that we've been using, and still do today, um, was um, based on the Framingham Heart Study, started in the 1950s, and we've been using data that was generated between about 19, late 1960s and the early 1980s. Um, and we've used these data in our risk prediction tools, mainly because until quite recently there hasn't been anything better. So this is another big challenge. If you're gonna move from disease to risk, where's the data to help you do that? So um, we started with risk charts, but um, by the end of the 90s, we'd moved to computerized versions. I mean, initially it was a PDF on, on someone's computer, but we then moved um, to a system um, we developed called PREDICT, which was an electronic decision support system. Um, GPs, uh, assessed risk in, um, in, in their surgeries. They plugged in risk factors into um, a, 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 an equation. Uh, it generated um, a risk estimate that they could use for informing treatment decisions. But in the process of doing that, we got a copy of the data. So, um, so every time a, a GP used this system, or uses this system called PREDICT, and a uh, we, uh, they're still using it in New Zealand. Um, we get a patient-specific risk profile, which you can see on the right, in that oval at the right. We then, because in New Zealand we all have a unique identifier, um, and we are able to link those, all of those patients' risk profiles to their subsequent hospitalizations and deaths plus drugs and labs, so we can do this linkage. And what we're in the process of doing is replacing the Framingham equation shown by the chart that I've crossed off with a New Zealand-based equation, which will also be very relevant to Australia, and we're producing these charts um, as we speak. And um, using this tool, um, this is the, the number of people in our PREDICT system. We, we, we now have um, over 400,000 people, mainly from Auckland and Northland, where we have this a complete risk profile that we're linking to outcomes. Um, so this is the kind of data um, that I believe is going to be uh, needed to provide us all with the risk prediction tools. And of course, I mean, uh, you know, we're, we're in the age of big data. Um, uh, now, in this country, the best electronic data is in primary care in terms of patient data. Um, our hospital system is still um, way behind in terms of capturing individual clinical data, and indeed I think Australia may be in the same situation. But I think the future to risk prediction is going to lie in, in bringing together patient, electronic patient data and linking it to outcomes. This will help us. So um, in conclusion, um, I've talked about that we need to think about risk rather than disease, and I've talked a bit about communicating risk, and um, yeah, finally, where I think we're going to get this data from. So I'll leave you where I started with Geoffrey um, Rose's um, statement. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.